Okay, get ready, because we're going deep on Einstein's theory of relativity. You guys sent us this article excerpt, and it, well, let's just say, you're clearly ready to go way beyond just EMC away. So get ready to have your mind blown wide open when it comes to space and time. I think what's really amazing about Einstein's theories is that it's not just some abstract math, you know? Yeah. It really changes how we understand, like, the entire universe mm. and our place in it. Yeah, absolutely. But before we get too deep into relativity, I think it's important to take a step back for a second. For centuries, the way we understood the universe was shaped by Isaac Newton and his laws of motion and gravity. Right, and Newton's ideas. They worked pretty well for a long time. But they were based on this idea that time and space were absolute. Like they were fixed and unchanging, you know? Kind of like a rigid grid that everything happens against. And then Einstein comes along and just throws that whole idea out the window. Exactly. He said, nope, space and time aren't separate things. They're actually woven together mm. into this like single fabric. And we call that space-time. Okay, so instead of a rigid grid, it's more like... Uh, a giant flexible sheet, like a trampoline or something. Exactly. That's a great way to visualize it. Like, imagine this vast cosmic sheet. That's space-time. Okay, I can kind of picture that. But how does this sheet, this space-time, relate to gravity? Like, Newton said gravity was a force between objects. Right? Yeah, and that's where Einstein really flipped the script. He said gravity isn't really a force the way we traditionally think of it. It's more like... Um, it's a consequence of the curvature of space-time. The curvature. Yeah, so imagine massive objects like stars and planets. They actually warp this fabric of space-time. Mm -hmm. And that warping, that's what we experience as gravity. So it's not that objects are pulling on each other. It's more like they're following the curves created by these massive objects in space-time. Exactly. The article uses this analogy of, like, a bowling ball on a trampoline. <laughs> the bowling ball creates a dip in the trampoline, right? And if you roll a marble nearby, it'll curve inward towards the bowling ball. It's not that the bowling ball is like pulling on the marble, it's just that the marble is following the curve. Oh, I see. So like the earth isn't being pulled by the sun's gravity, it's just following a curved path in space-time because the sun is so massive that it's warping the space-time around it. Exactly. That is so wild. Okay, so if space and time are part of this like unified fabric, does that mean time itself can be warped too? Yes. And that brings us to one of the most, I think, one of the most mind-blowing parts of relativity, time dilation. Time dilation. Yeah. Basically, Einstein realized that time isn't absolute, it's relative. Oh, yeah, hold on. So time can actually speed up or slow down? That sounds like something straight out of science fiction. I know, right? But it's a real thing. Yeah. So imagine we have two identical clocks, one here on Earth and another one on a spaceship. And this spaceship is traveling super fast, like close to the speed of light. Okay, so what happens to the clock on the spaceship? Does it just go crazy? Not exactly. The clock on the spaceship would actually tick slower compared to the clock on Earth. Whoa. And this isn't because of some mechanical problem with the clock. Time itself is actually flowing at a different rate for the clock on the spaceship because it's moving so fast. Okay, so the faster you move, the slower time goes for you. Exactly. It's pretty wild, right? My brain is definitely starting to hurt a little. I know, it's a <laughs> lot to take in. Now imagine taking that same spaceship and bringing it close to, like, a really massive object, like a black hole. Oh, boy. Yeah, the gravity of the black hole would warp space-time even more, and that would cause time to slow down even more dramatically. Yeah. For the spaceship, compared to us here on Earth. So someone hanging out near a black hole would age slower than someone here on Earth. Exactly. So time is, like, personalized. In a way, yeah. Time isn't this universal, constant thing. It's relative. Wow. So in a sense, we're all time travelers, just experiencing time at slightly different rates. That's a really interesting way to put it. Mm. And these differences in time flow, they're not just some theoretical curiosity. They actually have real world implications. Oh, really? Like what? Well, think about GPS. GPS satellites, they're orbiting Earth at really high speeds, right? And they're further away from Earth's gravitational field compared to us down here on the surface. Right. And those two things, the speed and the weaker gravity, they actually cause the clocks on GPS satellites to tick slightly faster than clocks here on Earth. Wait, faster? I thought you said things moving fast or in strong gravity have time slow down. You're right, you're right. It's all relative, remember. Compared to us, the satellite clocks are running faster <laughs> because they're in weaker gravity. But if you compared both the Earth clocks and the satellite clocks to a clock just floating out in deep space, both the Earth and the satellite clocks would be running slower. Ah, okay. So it all depends on your perspective. 
But if we didn't account for these like tiny time differences, yeah. what would happen to our GPS systems? Well, the GPS signals would drift out of sync. Yeah. And that would mean our GPS systems would be totally inaccurate. Your GPS might tell you you're miles away from where you actually are. Wow. So Einstein's theory of relativity, it's not just some crazy idea. It's literally built into the technology we use every day. Exactly. And that's just one example of how Einstein's work has changed our understanding of the universe. It's incredible. So time is relative. It can be warped by gravity and speed. Where do we even go from here? So we've been talking about how time is relative and can be warped by gravity and speed. But the article also mentions this speed limit of the cosmos. What's that all about? Ah, uh, yes, that's one of the biggest things to come out of Einstein's theory of special relativity. The speed of light is the ultimate speed limit. Nothing can go faster than light. Not even like spaceships in Star Wars. Nope, not even yeah. the Millennium Fell. <laughs> That's kind of a bummer for sci-fi fans. But why is the speed of light such a hard limit? Well, it has to do with how space-time works and the connection between mass, energy, and speed. Remember Einstein's famous equation, E, C, a play? Yeah, vaguely. <laughs> well, it tells us that energy and mass are like two sides of the same coin that can be converted into each other. Yeah. And as something speeds up, its mass increases. So the faster something goes, the heavier it gets. Exactly. And as an object gets closer and closer to the speed of light, its mass increases infinitely. Whoa. So it would take an infinite amount of energy to actually reach the speed of light. Exactly. Which is why it's impossible. That's wild. So the speed of light isn't just some random number. It's like a fundamental rule of the universe. Right. It's baked into the fabric of reality. And this speed limit, it has some pretty weird consequences, right? Yeah. For example, it means that looking out into space is actually like looking back in time. Wait, what? How does that work? Well, remember, light travels at a finite speed, even though it's really, really fast. When we look at distant stars and galaxies, that light has been traveling for a long time, sometimes billions of years. So the light from a star a billion light years away is showing us what that star looked like a billion years ago. Exactly. That's amazing. It's like the universe is a giant time capsule. I like that, a time capsule. And speaking of mind-blowing cosmic objects, we touched on black holes earlier. Can you tell us a bit more about them? Sure. Black holes are, in a way. They're the ultimate consequence of Einstein's theory of general relativity. They're regions of space-time where gravity is so intense that nothing, not even light, can escape. So how does something become a black hole? Well, imagine a star much bigger than our sun. And at the end of its life, it collapses in on itself. As it collapses, it gets denser and denser its gravity gets stronger and stronger. Eventually, it gets so dense that it creates a singularity, a point where gravity is infinitely strong. And that's a black hole. It's hard to even imagine something with that much gravity. But if light can't escape black holes, how do we even know they're there? We can't see black holes directly, but we can see their effects on the stuff around them. Like what? Well, if a black hole passes through a cloud of gas, for example, it'll pull that gas inward creating what we call an accretion disk. And this disk gets superheated and emits radiation, which we can detect with telescopes. So we can see the black hole's shadow. Exactly. Wow, that's pretty cool. So we can't see black holes directly, but we can see how they affect their surroundings. Right. Okay, I have to ask about gravitational waves. I mean, it took a century after Einstein predicted them, but we finally detected them in 2015. Yeah, that was a huge moment for physics. It's like we finally had a way to hear the universe. Hear the universe. Yeah, like <laughs> Einstein predicted that massive objects moving through space time would create these ripples, these gravitational waves, kind of like waves on a pond. And these waves, they carry energy. Exactly. And we actually built instruments to try and detect these waves. Yep, we built LIGO the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Catchy name. Right. And it's designed to pick up these tiny, tiny distortions in space-time caused by gravitational waves. And it worked. LIGO detected these waves from two black holes colliding over a billion light years away. I know, it's incredible. It's more than just confirming Einstein's theory. It's like a whole new way to study the universe. Exactly. It's like we've opened up this new window into the cosmos. This gravitational wave astronomy. It's still a very young field, but it has so much potential. It's exciting to think about what we might discover. I know, it's mind-blowing. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of Einstein's ideas, but are there any areas where we're still, like, scratching our heads? Oh, absolutely. One of the biggest challenges is trying to unify 
Einstein's theory of general relativity with quantum mechanics. Right, because relativity is all about gravity and the large-scale structure of the universe. Stars, galaxies, black holes, and quantum mechanics is about the very small, like the subatomic world of particles and forces. Exactly. And these two theories, they're both incredibly successful, but they seem fundamentally incompatible. That's weird. Right, so finding a way to combine them to create a theory of everything. That's one of the biggest goals of modern physics. A theory of everything, wow. So we've been on this deep dive exploring all these amazing ideas from Einstein, but it seems like there's still so much we don't know. Yeah, there's always more to discover. I guess that's what makes science so exciting. Exactly, it's a never-ending journey, and Einstein's work has given us this amazing roadmap. It's pretty humbling to think about how much is still out there. It is, but it should also make us feel a sense of wonder. We're part of this vast, incredible universe. Yeah. And we're still learning about its secrets. Yeah, it really is amazing. It's like we've got this incredible map of the universe, but we're still trying to figure out, like, what all the symbols mean. That's a great way to put it. And it's not just about scientists and labs and observatories, you know. We can all be a part of this discovery process. Oh, you mean just by, like, looking up at the stars and wondering about the universe? Exactly. That sense of awe and wonder. That's what drives scientific curiosity. But it goes even deeper than that. Einstein's work has actually affected our everyday lives in ways we might not even realize. Like how? Besides GPS, I mean. Well, think about the Hubble Space Telescope and those incredible images it sends back of galaxies and nebulae, all that advanced technology that makes those images possible. It's all based on our understanding of relativity. Wow, so even though we might not be thinking about Einstein, when we're looking at those Hubble pictures, his work is still there. Exactly. Relativity isn't just some abstract theory. It's part of our world. It shapes our technology. And it changes the way we see the universe. So we started this deep dive looking at this excerpt from an article. And we've explored some pretty mind-bending concepts. But relativity is more than just mind-bending. It's about understanding the very nature of reality, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's about appreciating the beauty of the universe. The way space, time, gravity, and energy, it's all connected. Einstein showed us that the universe is far stranger and far more amazing than we ever imagined. And there's still so much we don't know. That's right. There are still mysteries out there waiting to be solved. Who knows what incredible discoveries are still to come. Maybe someone listening to this deep dive right now will be the one to make those discoveries. That would be awesome. It all starts with curiosity and a willingness to ask questions. Well said. So we've come to the end of our deep dive into Einstein's relativity. We've gone from Newton's universe to this mind-bending world of space-time. We've talked about time dilation, the speed of light, black holes, gravitational waves. It's been quite a journey. It has. And I hope it's left everyone with a sense of awe and wonder about this incredible universe we live in. I think it definitely has. But even after all this, I still have so many questions. Like, if time can slow differently in different places, what does that even mean for our idea of the past, present, and future? Yeah, those are big questions. Questions that philosophers, physicists are still debating today. I guess that's part of the beauty of it all. The mystery keeps us exploring. Exactly. Well, we've reached the end of our deep dive. But the exploration never really ends, does it? It doesn't. Keep asking questions. Keep learning. And keep looking up at the stars. Until next time. <laughs>